Well, brothers and sisters, good morning. Oh, it is so good to see all of you. We have missed you. It is good to be back. Oh, I do hope everyone has been doing well and enjoying this beautiful spring weather. That should make all of us feel alive seeing everything that's budding out in the warm weather. So, so glad to see everybody today. Uh, just a few reminders on the, the bulletin. Don't pay attention to the date on the bulletin. It's what I wanted to do two weeks ago before we got sick. So we're just reusing the bulletin, so don't worry about the date. But they have the same opportunities in there. Got that committee meeting tonight at 5. Then we have April 1st, our Easter egg hunt, 2 to 4. Come on out. The more the merrier. Let's get everyone out, support our community, watch all the, the children have fun. Please pray for good weather. We'll have our Good Friday service at 7 o'clock, and then our Easter sunrise service also at 7 o'clock, but that is 7 in the a.m., so come on out, pray for good weather. Last year we had those geese fly by. I'll never forget that. That was so cool. There's just uh, a different experience when you worship outside, so come on out for that. Then we're going to have some breakfast together, and at 9 o'clock will be the Easter cantata. It's going to be a wonderful time. And it all basically starts next week with Palm Sunday. So we have made it, folks. But uh, I guess other than that, I don't really have any announcements except for what's in here. I've just been following you all on Facebook for two weeks. So if you have something you would like to say, just speak on up. And did I see a hand? Yeah. I want you to say something. I'm sorry my flowers have fallen over this way. <laughs> It sure is. Thank you, Gene. Yeah, if any of y'all haven't heard the story of the dogwoods that Gene just shared, look it up because it's, it's quite neat. You'll never look at a dogwood the same way again. It's a neat story. Well, folks, are there any other announcements before we begin today? Okay. Well, brothers and sisters, I've been waiting a while for this. So would you please rise if you're able. Open ear the faith we sing hymnal to number 2023. And let's get this day going by singing How Majestic Is Your Name.
in our greeting this morning. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise with songs and praise. Your steadfast love is better than life, and our lips will praise you. In the shadow of your wings we sing for joy. We will bless you as long as we live. We will lift up our hands and call on your name. Let us say our opening prayer together. God of wisdom, your word revives our soul. Grant us grace to see and follow Jesus, to offer his compassion to those in need, and to walk in the steps of his love for justice, that we may worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, you may be seated. As we center our lives for worship, today we are talking about humility. And humility is one of those things where once you think you have it, then it's gone. It's hard to, it's hard to pin down. And I wanted to share a story with you that I heard that stuck with me. And it's one of those stories where you can pick which character you think you are in the story. Well, a long time ago in a fairly small town, there was a man who was starting to get up there in age, and he would go to church, and, you know, well-respected in town for the most part. But at the same time, there were a lot of stories going around about the man, a lot of rumors, maybe some truths, some half-truths, some lies. You know what happens when something starts spreading. Because what this man would do is, Every Friday morning, he would wake up, and instead of doing his daily thing, Fridays was a special day. He'd wake up a little extra early. He'd try to halfway sneak out of town, didn't want to be around anybody. And then there was rumors every now and then that people would see him leaving some woman's house later on Friday morning before he made it back home. So that's what this man did. He wouldn't tell anybody what he was doing. So, of course, especially being in a smaller town, word got around. Oh, this man's doing an amazing thing. He's a church-going man. He, he's doing something. He's just being humble about it. Other people were a little bit more skeptical. I don't know if he's doing that. It's, I've, I've heard things. Right? Well, then we had a newcomer come to town. And as he started getting into the community and making friends, this newcomer heard through the grapevine about this odd man. Well, this newcomer decided, well, I'm going to figure this out for myself. I'm, I'm going to follow this man. You know, try not to be creepy about it, right? I'm going to follow this man. So he stayed out side, waited for the man to get up on Friday, and he followed him, and this man ended up going out into the woods, and he had an axe with him, and he would chop up a whole bunch of firewood, he'd load up his, his old beater truck, and then he'd drive to a home on the outskirts of town where a woman and her sick adult child lived. And he would deliver the firewood. He'd clean the fireplace. And it'd be enough to last all week. And then he would get back home, taken a long way so people didn't see him. And this man was no stranger to hearing rumors and about how well, he was seen with a woman. Well, he was. He heard every type of rumor you could find. But it didn't stop him from doing what he was doing. There's a lot of different characters in that story. I mean, all of us would like to be that man delivering the firewood. Or would you? When everyone is saying something about you. Or maybe, I hate to say it, 
but I think we've all been in this boat a time or two. Maybe you're one of those who started a rumor. Maybe you're like the new person. You're like, I gotta see this for myself. I've got to know what he's doing. Or maybe you're like the woman or the child in that story, the adult child, who needed the help and was gracious for it. And just think everyone's perspective in that. Think about the woman who needed the help. She heard rumors too. So folks, when it comes to humility, I ask, where do you find humility in this story? Where do you find responsibility? Where do you find your Christian duty? And I mean, for Pete's sake, when's enough enough? If you're the one serving for so long and you're getting bad-mouthed, or if you're the one who is accepting the service because you need it and you keep hearing negative stuff, where are you in this story? I'll tell you where I am in this story. I can see myself in each and every one of those people because I ain't perfect. Try. And I think I grow, but I can see a part of myself in each and every one of those people. Think of a story like that, folks, as you go throughout your daily lives. Because humility is not just a quality that you have, because if you know you have it, you ain't being humble. It's something other people are going to recognize about you. So in everything you do, and everything you say, and everywhere you go, people are quick to make spot-on, you know, snap judgments. And you, as followers of the Lord, as Christians, people might be looking at you a lot more than just someone walking through the store. So where do you find yourself in that story? And where's the humility? That's today's thought as we center our lives for worship. And with that, folks, I ask that we rise once again and open your The Faith We Sing hymnal, and let us praise God by singing God is So Good, number 2056. everyone believes everyone who just sang that and believe it say amen. amen amen do it again amen. amen one more time a little louder come on amen. amen there we go i love it yes well you may be seated folks oh that that's a, a simple song but man that is touching right amen for that well brothers and sisters our ushers are back there ready and waiting so now we have that time where we get to give back to god for god has given so much to us so, if our ushers would come forward this morning for our tithes and our offerings.
Lord, let the beauty of this time of year be a reminder of, oh, just how perfect you are, how you have paid attention to every detail, how you amaze us each and every day if we just have eyes to see what you have created, Lord. Lord, I pray that you create in all of us a clean heart, a refreshed spirit, feet that are eager to go to the people you would have us to go to, lips that are eager to sing praises, a tongue that is eager to talk about your word. Lord, I pray that our lives will be an offering to you. And I pray that you will take these tithes and offerings and multiply them for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, folks, now we have our prayers of the people. If there is anything that is lying on your heart today, anything that's been clouding your memory, you just got to get something off your chest. Now is a perfect time. You are among friends, family, believers. We are united in spirit. So let's be united in prayer as well. Just raise your hand. My friend, April Galloway, I requested prayer for her dad um, probably a couple months ago. He is um, take a, has taken a turn for the worse and is in the hospice home in Lexington. And her, prayer, her family would appreciate the prayers um, for this time as he, as he moves on. So remember them. And then my niece, Sarah, is getting ready to go to Africa on another mission trip. So please pray that she'll have safe travels. And, of course, keep my daddy in your prayers always. Thanks. Thank you, Lori. We will pray for April's dad, the whole family, and safe travels to Africa. That ought to, she ought to come back with some good stories. Yeah. About three weeks ago, my cousin, my beautiful cousin, her name is Gladys Sharp, <clears throat> and about three weeks ago, her sister couldn't get her to the phone, and so she went to her house, and she knocked on the door, couldn't get her to the door, and she went around back and found her sister laid out on the floor, unresponsive, and so they took her to Baptist, and now she's back in Taylorsville, but... Um, they don't know what happened to her, hmm. but she did some damage to some vertebrae, and now she cannot use her hands. She cannot walk, and uh, basically, she has to have total care now, and she's a lovely person. You'd like her immediately, but the sad thing about it is her husband was sprayed with Agent Orange, years ago and he was in a wheelchair and needed total care and he got COVID and of course he passed. But please pray for Gladys. She's a wonderful, wonderful girl and she's a little bit older than me but still she did a lot for God and she loves God but this is really hard on her. So if you could please pray for Gladys. She's a good girl. Thank you. We will, Tammy. We will play, pray for Gladys, for sure. Hmm. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, I know I mentioned last week about my cousin Larry Feimster. He had his surgery and they had to remove two thirds of one lung and he's, he's doing as good as can be expected. So he's in recovery and uh, just pray for him and his mom. She's at a nurse home until he can get back to where he can help look after her. So just pray for both of them. We sure will. Thank you, Ronald. Keep Larry in our prayers. So Sean made the golf team. All right. Uh, Good. He's going to have nice weather for it, too. Yeah. 
He played his first tournament Tuesday and finished eighth out of 36. So. Wow, that's a good way to start. Well, all right. Tell him congratulations for us. That's awesome. Um, I'm beginning to think that back trouble is contagious. Oh, it's, don't you <laughs> say it. <laughs> uh, first it was me, then it's Barbara. And starting last weekend, my uh, oldest daughter's husband, Jerry Mullis, uh, spent uh, Sunday night in the uh, urgent care in Mount Holly. And then another day last week, uh, or this week, uh, another night in an urgent care uh, and then saw a regular doctor and he's got major problems in his lower back too. Mm. So just be careful about who you're standing by. <laughs> uh, I told some of you last week that my brother had had a fall and wasn't doing well. Uh, he was in Baptist until uh, Thursday, I think Tuesday, I'm sorry. We went for a meeting on Tuesday and Actually, on Wednesday, they moved him to Wilkes Senior Village, uh, which is a long-term care facility, and he is receiving hospice care. We, he has dementia, and we don't know if it'll be a few days or a few weeks. Oh, we're going to lose him. Thank you for your prayers. I'm so sorry, Barbara. We will be praying for you and everybody. Carlos went with me to the grocery store because I can't reach anything out there. And, but I happened to run into uh, one of our neighbor's wife, and I asked her how he was doing, and she said, not good. But Betty Sue uh, Gibson said Jerry was getting worse all the time. She said he can hardly get out of the bed now by himself. And she said, I'll, I'm trying to manage, but she said it's getting harder and harder. And so they need our prayers because she looks so tired that uh, I know she's been having a hard time. So just remember them. We will, Tootie. Thank you. We will lift them up in prayer. I just saw that uh, it said wiped off the mouth. I guess some of you have seen this morning, and I think it's Rolling Fork, Mississippi, 26 dead. It lasted, the tornado lasted for about an hour, and they're expecting more today. So please, at one time, I think there were about 2,000 people in that village. It sounds like it's just real destruction. Mm-hmm. Yes, thank you, Jean. Yeah, the first one of the year, and hopefully not of, of many. That's, that's terrible, too. So we will keep that whole community in our prayers. Any other praises, prayers, anything laying on your heart that you wish to share? Well, thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. When I get to, when, when my seat is that camera back there, I can't see, which, which if y'all watch it on Facebook, you see like the first four or five pews or something like that. So all I got to stare at was some of y'all's back of the heads. And I like this view a lot better. Good to see you. I get to see y'all smiling this way. That's some pretty smiles. So I'm glad, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Glad y'all are here too. And folks... We will definitely keep everyone in prayer, so if you want, let us have a silent moment of prayer time, and then I will lead us in prayer today, so let us pray.
Well, merciful God, we call upon your mighty name today on this day that you have made. Lord, there's a lot going on in, in our lives and the lives of others. And Lord, when we stop to think about uh, the people and the places in our lives and those we hear about on the news, it still fails in comparison to know that you hear everyone's prayer individually. Lord, I don't know how you do it. And I suspect that one day when we make it to the other side of eternity, we might just get to watch as you hear everyone's prayer and answer them according to your will. But for today, Lord, we sit here in the holiness of this place. We sit here with our heads bowed. We sit with our thoughts and our heartaches and our happiness and our unanswered questions. And Lord, I just pray that that your spirit will move in each and every person here. Those watching, no matter where we are, we are united by your spirit, Lord. So strengthen us individually and together. Strengthen us, Lord. Move your spirit within us so even when we don't understand what is happening, we know that nothing surprises you and that you know the end from the beginning, and Lord, I pray that all of us have, oh, that we have not only read your word, and uh, Lord, I just pray that your word was planted within each of us as a living seed, so that when we read it, that we just take it, and it grows within us to where it is overflowing, and we can't help but believe. And by faith, Lord, we know that you are there, that you are with us right now, that you're hearing our thoughts and you're hearing our prayers. We know that you are closer than a brother. And Lord, there are many ways that we can see you in our lives. So Lord, change our hearts, renew our vision, Lord. So that no matter where we go or what happens or who we are around, the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, is guarding our hearts and souls and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we have but a short time on this earth, and it's not guaranteed to be easy. It's up to each person to determine just how successful their life will be. We each define success in a different way. And Lord, as long as it glorifies you when we're doing what you would have us to do and using your gifts and talents that you have given to us, that's all the success I can think this world needs. Lord, sometimes the humblest prayer is when we don't know what to pray. Sometimes the humblest person is that person that doesn't know what to do. When the world feels like it's dragging us down, like it's beating us down. When we've been told something about our faith our entire lives and then it becomes tested. Lord, I pray those are the times that we feel your presence stronger than ever. Draw near to each and every person here. Answer their prayers according to your will. We lift up all these names and all the silent prayers. Lord, lead us and guide us throughout our lives. Let us walk in the humility that Jesus Christ has shown us. Increase our faith, Lord, so when we're around others, 
we strengthen those because you have strengthened us. So Lord, I'm not going to ask that you hear our prayer today. I'm going to say that we believe you hear our prayer today. Be with each and every person, Lord. Guide us throughout this week and these coming weeks because you hear our prayer and you love us and we love you. So Lord, let us pray through the Spirit the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture for this morning is from Philippians, and it's chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any sharing in the Spirit, any sympathy, complete my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united, and agreeing with each other. Don't do anything for selfish purposes, but with humility. Think of others as better than yourselves. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, watch out for what is better for others. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thank you. Well, folks, I was reading a story about a different kind of bicycle race in India. The object of this race was to go the shortest distance possible, not the longest, but the shortest distance possible within a specified amount of time. Now everyone lined up and when the gun sounded and the race began, all the bicycles as best as they could stayed put. That'd be hard, right? Now, what makes it even harder is the racers were disqualified if they toppled over or if they even used a toe to help balance it. No touching. That's the point of the race. And so, as you would watch this race, they would just inch forward just enough to try to keep their bike balanced. When time was up, the person who had gone the farthest was the loser, and the person who was closest to the finish line was the winner. Now, folks, imagine getting into a race like that and not knowing how the race works. When you show up, you are... You got your gear on, you got your, your bike, you got your racing tires on. I mean, you ready to go. You've been practicing. You are geared up for this. Then when you hear the gun go off and the race starts, you book it. You are pedaling just as fast as you can. And even though you've been training for it, it don't take long for you to get out of breath because you just flew off that starting gate. And you want to know how good a lead you got. So, you know, you look back and everyone is way behind you. And you're like, man, I'm really good at this. I mean, that training pays off, right? Practice makes perfect. Maybe it's the bike. No, it's probably not. I think it's me using the bike. It's, I've been training for a long time. Look at all those people. I mean, I have a gigantic lead. I'm going to break a record today, folks. This is my day. Well, folks, you know, as hard as you've been pushing, as much training as you put into it, as excited as you are as you look back and think to yourself, man, I am a good bike racer, you're not going to end up being thrilled, are you? Because when it comes to the end of the race and you think you are unquestionably the winner, it turns out that you are unquestionably the loser because you desire to run the race by your own rules. Took for granted what you thought it was going to be, had your own rules, your own preconceived ideas, and you just peddled with it. We know ever since Adam and Eve, each generation has desired to run the race of life in their own way. And a lot of life can be tied up into a bike race like that. Because sometimes it might feel like you're just inching along, trying to keep some balance in life. 
Maybe you need a break and you got to put that foot down, but you're thinking in the back of your head, if I put my foot down, take a break now, I might not never get back up again. And then there are other times in life where you feel like you just got to book it. I got to run away from something. I got to run to something. I'm excited about something. I am wishing time away because I want this to come into my life, whatever it is. Maybe it's an awesome vacation you've been saving for. Maybe it's to see a grandchild. It can be something good, folks. But you wish in time away just so that day would come. And even though you embrace that day, and it's a day oh, full of wonderful memories that you are going to cherish there is going to come a time when you are sitting in your recliner and you're thinking to yourself, boy, where did all the time go? How did I keep my balance? And you know, folks, what we try to do is, you know, we try to keep our balance in life. We try to make something of ourselves because of that. We all have goals, ambitions. That's good. You need them. Pursue them. Go after them. Pedal after them things. But we have these ambitions. We want to succeed. We want to be a success for any number of reasons. Every one of us, I pray, has a drive, some type of motivation that gets them out of bed in the morning and makes this day better than the day before. I pray you have something like that. But folks, we're not too far removed from Adam and Eve they wanted to make something different out of their situation. We like to make something different out of ours. And when we try to do this, we end up running the race by our own rules, by the way we think things ought to go. Then we, what we end up doing is we start putting I in front of everything else. And you might not even know it. Let me give you some examples of how we put I in front of everything else and it's these examples where most of the world won't be able to say it with you we are blessed to live where we live but a lot of the world can't say this with you and there are things like i graduated high school i graduated college i have this job i have this job making lots of money i have retired or have the chance to retire. A lot of the world can't say those eyes along with you. But there are other things that the world can say with you when we put I in front of everything else. We can all say things like, I've been here longer than you. We can say things like, oh, I have this talent. I have this gift. I want people to know about it. We can say things like, oh, I've paid my dues. We can say things like, I've been around the sun more times than you have. Mm -hmm. You know, I has become the shortest word with the longest explanation that nobody can define except the one who only sees themselves. I writes its own rules because it wants to run its own race and maybe get others to abide by its rules. This world is filled with lots of eyes, and it's evident because we see all these disagreements. We see fighting, racism, all this discord going on. And what, what gives anybody the right to feel superior? What gives anybody the right to complain? You know, you may be educated, you may have experience in a certain field, you might have made more trips around the sun. However, there is a huge gap between wisdom and knowledge, but only a small leap between knowledge and arrogance. Folks, I don't believe it's a coincidence that I is in the middle of pride. In a world that says things like this, if it feels right, do it. Or you might have heard, I know my truth. Or you might have heard something like, I am the measure of my success. Then what you get, folks, is people making their own rules, yet expecting everyone else to abide by them. And you can have the grandest of goals 
in the eyes of life. You can be a hard-working father supporting your family, pulling long hours, but then one day you're going to regret not being around your family. You can spend a lot of time at school pursuing some degree that's going to give you some job that's going to get you and your family set. Awesome. But you're going to still have regrets if that's your only focus. Folks, right there, I speak from experience. I've been a full-time student for eight years. I've even done it during summer to try to get stuff done. I started when my boys were two feet tall. That's been my full-time career plus a job on the side, now school and pastor, and then look at them now. You want to know a pastor's heart? Well, I think all the stuff that I've missed, I ain't doing that to try to change your mind or bring a tear to your eye. I just always like being honest. Everyone has some type of regret, even if it's the grandest of thing you're trying to chase. Because, folks, I will get in the way. I will get in the way. I might have even gotten in your way. And vice versa. I has a way of only seeing ourselves, even if we have the most loftiest of goals. You know, there's another popular quote, I've heard it a bunch, and there's different versions of it, but it all says the same thing. It says, success is nothing more than living your life according to your own truth and your own terms. Now think about that as a Christian. Where does your faith fit into that? Success is nothing more than living your life according to your own truth and your own terms. Well, I get the living your life part. I get that. But when it comes to living your faith, how does Christianity fit into your own truth on your own terms? How are we going to be united in that? You know, when, when people live by some type of philosophy like that, I know my truth, I'm going to live by it, my terms, yada, yada. Well, then what we start doing is we start feeling like we're privileged, right? We start looking down upon others. I see this a lot. I know you've seen this a lot. You know, a great example is going to a fast food place. You know, I, we go to fast food places a lot. Lives are so busy with all our schedules and everything going on. We eat fast food way more than we should. But you go into fast food places and you hear people say things like, well, you know what, at least they're working. And we say things like, well, you got to do what you got to do. True statements. Yeah, at least they are working. And sometimes you do have to do what you got to do. But folks, I say fast food because why do we think fast food is a humble position? Why do we think they're doing what they got to do? You know, I had to ask myself this. I used to work at McDonald's way back in the day. But I have to ask, in, in your life right now, where you find yourself right now, I don't care if you don't need the money, would you go and work at McDonald's just to help out? During the dinner rush, or the third shift, or the Friday night, or the Christmas day? Would you do something like that? Just to help out? You know, then we have these these food banks, and we have soup kitchens, and we have homeless shelters. And a lot of people describe the people that go help out at these places, that's a humble person, because they're going to help out. Well, whoever said you needed humility to go do that? Whoever says you need to be humble to serve those who are at their lowest? you got to be humble for that. Anyone can do that. Humility is not working at a fast food place. Humility is not going and serving at like a soup kitchen or something like that. Because whoever said that those are low positions? 
If you've ever gone anywhere and judged someone by the way they look, by the way they acted, what they're doing, especially in a fast food place, well, folks, then what we're doing is we're getting awfully close to being prideful because we're setting ourselves up and going, you know what, at least they're working, but I need to hurry up and get my food. At least they're working so I can enjoy my Sunday off, go to church, take a nap while they're busting their hump. And folks, when we end up feeling entitled, when we feel like we don't have to do certain things because we have put in our time, then we start pridefully living by our own rules. We start running the race the way we want to run the race. And here's the catch, folks. This describes the unchurched as well as the churched. Going to church doesn't mean you are a Christian. It means you go to church. And if you call yourself a Christian, yet stand back and examine yourself like the Bible tells us to, take an honest look at yourself, failures, faults, successes, everything, take an honest look at yourself, and if you whine more than you worship, or if you tend to be more rude, or overbearing, or judgmental, or bossy, or condescending, quick to judge, thinking you got all the answers. If you find fault more than you do fellowship, if you feel like you are defeated in life, like you're starting to lose that balance, if you feel like God is becoming more distant from you, then you might just be placing I before the great I am. Because as James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If you are walking in your Christian life, but you feel defeated, or if you're getting weary and wore out, or if you feel like God is starting to become more distanced, then folks, take an honest look at your life because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that's the tricky thing about pride, because pride in its correct form, it can be a very attractive quality desiring excellence, the aspiration to your best, a sense of achievement, are all beneficial effects of healthy, unsinful pride. But the problem is when we let pride run rampant, pride's very close friends, egotism and vanity, tend to take over. Then what happens is pride hurts our relationships with others and with God, because when we're prideful, we end up taking too much credit for the things that we have, for our achievements. And we come to look at ourselves as products of our own doing rather than a gift from Almighty God. And when we do this, we're moving dangerously close to the sin of idolatry, which is making ourselves into little gods. And that's why we need to remember two things, and you have heard these two things a lot. The first is there is only one God. And the second, you ain't him. As theologian Andrew Murray said, in God you come up against, against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know that, you do not know God at all. You know, to know God is to know God as Redeemer, as Creator, the one who marked out the rules. And Jesus does not hide the rules. In fact, see, gives us the rules, the winning strategy for life and for all eternity is to love God, love your neighbor as yourself. All the other commandments fall into those. Folks, it is letting others go first. It is taking the table in the back and not pushing yourself up to the front. It is giving without expectation of getting anything in return because you love God and you love your neighbor that much. To transform from a churchgoer to a Christian follower, from being overcome to being an overcomer, from sin to salvation and from hell to heaven, it is to learn holy humility, which is a right judgment of ourselves. Humility is the honest recognition of our own worth, our worth as God sees us. It is that delicate balance between humbly recognizing our sin, yet knowing how much God loves and values you. It's not degrading yourself by lowering your self-worth because all that does is it denies the value God placed on you when God created you in his image. 
and when he sent his son to die for you. That's why humility is hard to grasp in ourselves, because once we think we have it, then it's gone. You can never be proud of your humility. Therefore, as today's scripture says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness or compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Folks, where pride builds walls, humility builds bridges. There's a whole lot of people in the world who like the idea of love, of common sharing, of tenderness and compassion, but they do so according to their own rules. And anymore, what we find is being like-minded falls under the person's terms and conditions. These are my standards, my terms. Well, brothers and sisters, Today's scripture is extremely important in your walk with Christ because it is where the rubber meets the road. And I want you all to open your Bibles to today's scripture because I want you to see this and not just hear me talk about it. So open your Bible, get one in front of you, open it to today's scripture. Philippians 2, chapter 1, Philippians 2, verse 1 through 11, excuse me, because this is the gauge of your Christianity to measure where you are in your walk of faith. Today, this scripture is where the rubber meets the road. This is the test, folks. This is the description or the non-description of your life, and you have to see it. So I pray Jesus opens your eyes like the blind man so you can see it. Today's scripture begins with, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... Folks, if you have any encouragement from being a Christian, if you have any encouragement from being saved, if you have any happiness in knowing where you're going when you pass away, if you have any joy in being a Christian, then your words, your actions, your lifestyle will be the proof. Today's scripture continues. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Folks, that right there is the standard. Break that, and you are breaking the greatest of commandments that Jesus talked about. And herein lies the great difference between being a fan of Jesus and a follower of Jesus, because there is a difference. Remember, fans can still follow something. You can be a fan of a sport and still follow that sport. But when it comes to your faith, there is a difference between being a fan of Jesus and a follower of Jesus. You look at today's scripture, there are 11 verses in today's scripture. 11 verses. I want you to look at the first four verses. If you desire the first four verses to characterize your life, if you want those to be an accurate description of your Christian testimony, then you have to follow Jesus' example in verses 6 through 11. If you want the first four verses to characterize your life, then you need Jesus' example in verses 6 through 11. And that makes verse 5 the turning point, folks. Verse 5 is the turning point between pride and humility and from saying you are a Christian to actually living as a Christian because it redirects our focus from ourselves to God. Jesus is the true example of humility and if we say we follow Christ then we also have to live as Christ does. Jesus Christ who is God Almighty made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Think of that. Let it sink in for a minute. Folks, I don't care how great your accomplishments are. They are nothing in comparison to the God who created everything, yet came to serve you, even if it meant washing your dirty, stinky, nasty feet, because there was no job too low for the name that is above every name. Wow. You know, we can all be glad in our accomplishments and the accomplishments of others. We can all be excited when we meet that famous person. I don't care if you meet the president tomorrow. We can still be a little nervous as we shake a, our shaky hand to go shake the president's hand or whoever it is. 
But brothers and sisters, the humblest person to ever live is the God who created humanity, served humanity, and died for humanity. Follow anyone or anything else, and you are following the lesser. Follow Jesus in word and deed, and God will also exalt you to the highest, highest place, where you will worship the name that is above every name. Folks, the journey of faith is a lifelong process in which believers are perfected in love. Growing into Christian perfection implies that we become increasingly filled with God's love and become holy as God is holy, because being humble means being teachable. Being humble means being teachable. For some of you, this might look like growing as a student in school or a student in the school of life. For others, it might mean living your faith surrounded by other believers. It could look like a sacrifice as you walk into the unknown because you're walking out of a sinful environment. It might be transforming faith into belief. It might be finding new ways to serve the Lord despite your limitations. Being humble means being teachable. It reminds me of two brothers who went off to college together. The one brother started, st uh, studied agriculture, and he went back to the family farm, and he ended up inheriting the family farm. He just loved to be a farmer. His other brother wanted nothing to do with being on the farm, and he ended up going to school to become a very powerful lawyer, very wealthy, very powerful. He was a good lawyer. He played on the stock market and even made money there. Lived in New York City, enjoyed every bit of it. Two brothers who grew up so close ended up becoming adults and growing so far apart. What ended up happening is after about 10 years or so, the lawyer he started missing home, and he wanted to go back home for a minute and say hey to his brother. So he left New York, and he went back home. And his farmer brother knew he was coming, and he seen him coming down the long dirt road, and he waited for him. And they met out there in the driveway. They shot the breeze for a little bit, exchanged pleasantries, and the fancy, rich lawyer brother said, I can't believe you haven't made anything yourself. You're out here on the farm. You went to college just to come back home. But look where I am. I got this fancy degree. I have multi-million dollar clients, and I'm a millionaire myself. I'm a powerful learn, uh, attorney. I've done all this, live in New York. I have all these toys, yada, yada, you name it. He's just bragging. Then he says, here you are stuck out on the farm, I wonder what the difference between us is. Well, the farmer brother, he didn't expect nothing less, and he just stared, gazing out over his field, and he took a breath, and then he pointed out to his field. And he said, you will see two types of wheat out here, brother. You'll see wheat that's standing straight up. In the head of that wheat, there is nothing. It's empty. That's why it's standing so high. You'll also see some other wheat that is bent over. That's because the head is full. It's full of wheat. Folks, some of us are standing straight up. We are walking tall. However, we're only able to do so because we're empty. Other people are walking a little bent over, maybe even a lot bent over from all life has given them. But they're indicating that they're full. So folks, the test isn't what you've done or what's in your pocket or what you're willing to do. It's what you got in your heart, folks. Because the higher you rise in the likeness of Jesus, the lower you will stoop in your service to others. And as long as you have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, being humble means being teachable. Amen? Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, with that... If you're able, please rise and let us praise God one last time this morning as we sing together. We're marching to Zion. It is number 733 in your hymnal.
Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 